um, um, I'll invite um, uh, Rachel and Ruth to um, start to talk to us all about restructuring and insolvency and initial considerations and advice for directors. Thank you for the introduction, Mark. Uh, we appreciate that many of you in the legal profession will have a clear understanding of the legal points that we will go through today. But this presentation is based on what we would cover with directors at initial meetings, given their general knowledge uh, and is included for your reference. Succession planning. As insolvency practitioners here at Milstead Langdon, we're often approached by individuals seeking advice in their personal capacity and directors on behalf of limited companies. We're going to concentrate today on corporate inquiries. From a solvent perspective, an organisation may want to simplify its structure for a number of reasons. And these could include preparing part of the group for sale or to facilitate succession planning. A method for this is to undertake a Section 110 demerger, which enables parts of a company that have been under common ownership to be divided into separate entities. The Insolvency Act allows a liquidator to accept shares in consideration for assets transferred from a holding company to at least two new companies set up specifically to reorganise the group. The company's accountants and solicitors are heavily involved in these processes to help plan the strategy, set up new companies and request tax clearance from HMRC. Today, though, we're going to discuss in more detail the options for potentially insolvent companies. So initially, we hold a meeting with the director to identify the nature of the business and its current position. And at this stage, it can be really helpful to speak to the accountant and solicitor, especially if there are any actions being taken either by or against the company. Ask the director what ideally they want as an outcome. Some have a definitive answer, but many don't. We set a shopping list of information to gather for further meetings where we discuss whether we can achieve their desired outcome or whether we need to consider alternative options. So when should a director call in the experts? Ordinarily, a director has a duty to the company and its shareholders and must act in their best interest. However, once a company experiences financial problems and may be deemed to be insolvent, the directors must act in the best interest of creditors and not make their position worse. Simply put, insolvency can be described as being unable to pay creditors as and when they fall due, or that the company's liabilities are greater than its assets. So some of the warning signs to look out for for a pending insolvency that we see are the inability to pay debts as they fall due, CCJ's statutory demands or winding up petitions being made against the company, a decrease in working capital, payments of dividends when there are insufficient reserves, unusual transactions in the director's loan account, company's house non-filing, which many directors are unaware can lead to a strike-off process, HMRC time to pay arrangements, the sale of key assets, high staff turnover, directors missing in action, or the failure or loss of key suppliers or customers. Work considerations and trading implications. There's no particular order to what we're going to cover, but this would be one of the key ones that we would want to. At our first meeting, we will try to establish how much time the director and the company have before the point of no return. We will ask to review any management accounts if available and gain a general understanding of how the company operates. Sometimes it can be acceptable to trade on prior to entering an insolvency process, such as administration and liquidation. And this is acceptable where there would be a benefit to the company. This could be where the completion of a piece of work is profitable. And this can be established by identifying the completed stages of the contract the cost of the work yet to complete, whether the company owns the stock required to complete the work, or whether it holds sufficient cash to purchase what it would need, as at this stage, the director should not be taking out any further credit. 
Another aspect to consider is whether the company utilizes its own staff or has the additional burden of the costs of subcontractors who, if not paid up to date, may not be willing to undertake further work. We would also look at the position of the work in progress. Are there stage payments that could be jeopardized if the insolvency process was triggered? And therefore, a short period of trade to allow their collection may be beneficial. When dealing with JCT contracts in a construction company, careful consideration is needed as to whether there is the right to offset losses between contracts. And when dealing with these sorts of considerations, we would often involve specialist solicitors or agents to review the contracts. Period of trading under the protection of an administration would be beneficial. While, for example, we finalize the sale of the business, we would need to consider whether industry-specific trading licenses were required. Examples of this could be a license to sell alcohol if we were dealing with a pub, care quality commission licenses and registration if we were dealing with a care home. We also need to consider the implications such as health and safety, fire regulations, environmental issues, etc. But also talk to the major stakeholders to gauge their support. For example, is the bank account overdrawn and would the bank continue to fund trade until a sale could complete? Do we think that key suppliers are willing to support a period of trade? For example, a printing company would need a supply of paper. And if this could only be supplied by one supplier, how much are they owed? Or do we have the funds to buy the stock in cash? However, it may be that matters are not under the director's control. And this is often the case where a creditor has not been paid and is taking action to recover the debt. This recovery action can lead to county court judgments or staff demands being issued against the company. These in turn can lead to a petition being presented for the winding up of the company. As you're aware, if the director does not think that the debt is payable, the company can apply to set aside a county court judgment explaining why he does not think payment is due. Have they done this or have they ignored it? In respect to the statutory demand, there are normally 21 days to respond. And if the debt is due, the company can try and reach an agreement to pay the debt. This will avoid a petition for the winding up of the company, which can be made for any debt over £750. A petition can seriously reduce the company's options as the bank will usually freeze any trading accounts once the petition is advertised in the London Gazette, leaving it impossible for the company to continue to trade. So the next thing we look at will be the premises that the company trades from. Most cases that we deal with trade from rented premises. If the status of the lease is unclear, we would ask a solicitor to review the tenancy agreement to see whether there is the security of tenure, which gives the tenant the right to automatically re lease renewal when it reaches the end term date. We would look at the terms of the lease, any break clauses, when rent payments are next due and the length remaining on the lease. Often the company would have instructed a solicitor to negotiate the lease, and if so, we would make contact to seek their view. Terms of a lease usually imply that if the tenant is late in making a payment, then it is in default and the landlord can do any of the following. Charge interest for the late rent payments. Draw the unpaid rent from the rent deposit previously paid. Seek the payment from any guarantor, or if they can initiate debt recovery, or undertake commercial rent arrears recovery through an out-of-court process where enforcement agents may visit the company to collect the rent or seize goods to the value for the unpaid rent. For the landlord to use this scheme, the rent must have been payable at least seven days ago and they must serve notice on the company before any enforcement agents can carry out their work. A lease may also have a clause that details, details forfeiture, which is the process for eviction. During our initial conversation with directors, we would advise that the director does not make contact with the landlord until the most appropriate insolvency process has been identified and we have a clear strategy in place. If there is a business worth saving, we would make contact with the landlord to discuss the options of a surrender or novation of the lease. 
However, if the company is closing, we as liquidators would disclaim the lease shortly after our appointment. Where the premises are owned by the company, we would look at whether the bank has a fixed charge over the property, when was it last valued, and we would speak to an agent to gauge the current position and market appetite for this type of property. Good borrowings and finance agreements are often in place. So a creditor with a fixed charge over assets has the right to receive the funds from any sale of, of the asset, less the costs of sale or take control of said assets. We will always seek the agreement of the creditor prior to any sale being made. This type of asset could be, for example, the premises or generally larger equipment or machinery. There are also floating charges that have charges over current assets, which would include the cash of bank or debtors. We would only receive dividend in an insolvency procedure after the preferential creditors and office holders' fees and expenses have been paid. That's subject to leased or higher purchase agreements. These often include vehicles and equipment and if on lease and no longer required by the company, can be returned to the provider. However, an asset on a higher purchase may have equity and therefore value for the company. It's therefore important that we have signed the finance agreements and work with the provider if the continued use of the asset. Retention of title is where there is a clause between the contract, in the contract, sorry, between the buyer and the seller where the seller retains legal ownership of the goods until certain obligations are met by the buyer. These clauses generally fall into two categories. A simple clause where the seller can take back the unsold stock supplied against a specific unpaid invoice, or an all monies clause, which is more complex, and is where the seller can take back any stock held by the company up to the value of the total unpaid sums due. However, this is more involved in that the seller must look at their account with the company and can only claim stock against invoices issued since the balance of the account with the seller was last cleared to nil. Book debts. Book debts can be financed in two ways. Invoice financing, whereby the company borrows against their unpaid customer invoices. It retains control of its sales ledger and is responsible for collecting the debts. An invoice factoring, where the company sells its sales ledger to a third party who in turn collects the debts. This can have a significant impact on the balance sheet and is therefore imperative that the type of book debt financing is fully understood. And then we go on to discuss with the director what their options are should the company be deemed insolvent. So one of the, uh, the processes that we look back at, look at is administration, which is a procedure that can be instigated by the director, shareholders or the creditors. You can have the benefit of a quicker out of court appointment and in turn provides a moratorium which stops any creditor commencing or continuing legal action against the company. This therefore gives the company some breathing space. However, the process cannot be used in any scenario and we need to ensure that we can fulfill one of the three statutory purposes. Firstly, can we rescue the company as a going concern by way of a share sale, for example, or entering into an agreement with creditors to pay off the debt while it continues to trade? If that can't be achieved, we look to see if we can achieve a better result for the company's creditors as a whole than would be likely if the company were wound up. This could involve undertaking a marketing campaign to complete the sale of the trade of the company. Finally, if neither of the above are possible, we look to see if we can realize property in order to make a distribution to one or more secured or preferential creditors. And preferential creditors are employers, employees with arrears of wages and or holiday pay, or HMRC debt for PAYE, employees NI deductions and VAT collected. At each stage of our strategy planning, we will also be in conversation with the stakeholders, be it the bank to support trade while the at, until the date of administration, or shareholders for further investment. We will gauge the feelings of the staff, 
Do we think they'll support a period of uncertainty or will they jump ship at the first sign of trouble? What is the landlord's position? And all of these conversations will help build a picture and determine the route we will look to follow. If an administration is not an option, it may be that a company voluntary arrangement can be set up. This is a process where the director would put forward a proposal to the company's creditors, which usually includes an element of debt write-off. The proposals will set out the pence in the pound that the creditors can expect as a dividend from the arrangement. It should offer a better return to creditors than would be expected under a liquidation procedure. However, realistically, these are difficult to get through, especially if HMRC is not on board where a time to pay agreement is already in place. There's also the added complexity of the business needing sufficient cash to continue to trade as credit will be more likely to be withdrawn. Creditors would vote on whether to accept the proposals and it will need 75% of those creditors voting to approve. If accepted, it is a legally binding agreement on all creditors. The supervisor will monitor that the company is complying with the terms of the arrangement, but does not have direct control of the company. From the recoveries received, dividends are paid to creditors in line with the terms of the arrangement. There is the risk though that failure of the arrangement can lead to the liquidation of the company. So we will only proceed with this as an option if we are confident that it is the right process. If we don't think there are grounds for an administration or a CVA, it is likely that we'll need to look at the closure of the company by way of a liquidation. A creditor's voluntary liquidation is led by the director and is an out of court procedure. 75% of shareholders votes so at a general meeting are required, or if sought by written resolution, it would need 75% of all shareholders to pass the resolution. Therefore, choosing the right route is important if you have an uncooperative shareholder. If this was the case, we would meet with the shareholder to find out what their objections to the liquidation are and aim to agree a strategy that suits everyone. Two further options recently introduced into the insolvency regime that you will no doubt be aware of are the moratorium, which gives a company protection from creditor action while it considers a rescue plan and is a short term procedure. And the restructuring plan, which will often be heavily involved solicitors and enable a company to produce a propose a compromise to its creditors and shareholders that combined secured, unsecured and dissenting creditors. Although both were recently introduced, we have not seen a significant uptake of these procedures for various reasons, but primarily it is the high cost of putting forward a restructuring plan as it involves a number of court applications and is therefore better suited to the larger company, less often seen in owner managed businesses. key matter that we try and cover in the first meeting with the director would be the employee considerations. Often a director's main concern that they may have loyal staff that have been with the company for many years and they feel they are letting them down. If the company is considering redundancies, it has a duty to consult with its employees. This should be 30 days where there are 20 to 99 redundancies anticipated and 45 days where there are over 100. If it's 19 or less, there are no rules in respect of consultation. Failure to consult can be costly and result in an employment tribunal, which can make a protective award against the company. It's therefore important that the strategy is clear, that consultation is undertaken where possible, and timing is nearly always an issue. And it's important to recognise that subcontractors are not a category of employee. The Redundancy Payment Service is a government department which will step in once a company enters liquidation or administration to ensure that each staff member receives all payments that are due to them, be it arrears of pay, unpaid holiday, redundancy or pay in lieu of notice. The Redundancy Payment Service will pay up to a maximum weekly amount, which is currently £700 for the statutory periods. We would also clarify any unpaid pension payments, which would also be covered by the Redundancy Payments Service, together with any tribunal judgments. 
Once we're appointed, our duties as office holder is to safeguard and realise the company's assets. We would need to establish where the assets are, as they can be held away from the trading premises. And once we have a valuation, we need to consider if it is cost effective to realise these assets, as the agent's cost to collect them and then sell them may outweigh the benefit to the estate. Our work may involve working with an agent to collect and sell physical assets. However, we do need to be aware that HMRC may have attended site and identified assets that they are looking to distrain over in order to recover its debt. We collect cash at bank balances and pursue debtor recovers, which can be protracted, especially where they are listed in the accounts, but due to their age are unrecoverable. The work may not have been completed to a satisfactory standard and are therefore disputed, or well, they may have been overstated in the accounts and not due at all. Asset recoveries are undertaken with the aim to paying the cost of the process and then hopefully make a dividend payment to creditors in the following order. Firstly, a dividend to ordinary preferential creditors, which includes staff, arrears of pay and holiday pay, and any payments made in this respect by the redundancy payment service. Then we would pay any secondary preferential creditor, being HMRC for VAT collected, and PAY deducted from star salaries. After this, should there be any funds, we would pay the unsecured creditors, being the trade creditors, staff for redundancy and pay in lieu of notice, the banks and other HMRC debts. We also advise the directors on the implications for them and personal guarantees they may have given. Every administrator or liquidator has to undertake an investigation into the affairs of an insolvent company and the conduct of its directors. We advise the directors that any IP will review the company records and su submit a report to the Secretary of State. If offences are identified, this can lead to the disqualification of an individual from acting as a director for anything from two to 15 years. This can have serious implications on any other company that the individual is involved with, because whilst disqualified, they can act in the formation or management of a company. One thing we quite often see is a director or shareholder drawing funds which are converted to dividends. The danger here is that there will be no distributable profits, and therefore these payments will need to be paid back if the company goes into an insolvency process. The documentation for dividends should be prepared at the same time as the dividend is paid. Payments made to any associated parties ahead of other creditors are deemed preference payments and would need repaying. Likewise, assets should not be disposed of at an undervalue. It should also be noted that a director cannot offset any money he owes to the company under his overdrawn director's loan account against any monies he may be due from the company. Personal guarantees are where a director guarantees that if a company cannot pay a debt, then he himself would repay the creditor. If the creditor pursues the director, then we would suggest that they firstly ask for a copy of the signed guarantee. If it is valid, then they would need to negotiate with the creditor some sort of repayment. This could be a charge on their property, monthly payments, or a full and final settlement offer. Once we're appointed, we act on behalf of the creditors, and if we identify an asset, we would have to pursue its recovery for their benefit. When we initially write to whoever holds the asset and ask, sorry, we will initially write to whoever holds the asset and ask for its repayment or return. If they do not cooperate, we do need to consider whether it's commercially viable to continue to seek recovery. We may then instruct solicitors to send a letter before action, request an offer for settlement, or even instigate court proceedings. If the estate has no money for legal action, then there are still a number of options open to us. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to Mark uh, Anecto Legal to go through some of those with you. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. And 
Let me see if I can share my screen this time. Does that come up properly on your side, Ruth? Yes. That's excellent stuff. All right. Well, always start with a disclaimer. Yeah. Don't trust anything I say. The um, uh, why is this not changing? There we go. Right. Um, we've got, I think, twenty-five minutes to. Uh, to That was fun. It just threw me out. And now I'm back in again. So let me see. Does that come up again? Can you see that, Ruth, on your side? I can see allowing clients to make an informed decision. That's what we're seeing. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. Um, okay. So um, quick kind of tour of funding for uh, disputes in insolvency. So everything we're looking at today is just allowing you guys to make informed choices on behalf of your clients. So looking first of all at the stick, um, what are the obligations uh, professionally and what you have to do uh, to fulfill those? And then the carrot, which is the opportunities that are created by actually exploring all of the different options around litigation. So uh, can you create value perhaps where there wouldn't be otherwise by uh, finding claims that you could pursue? Uh, that ordinarily you might think weren't uh, proportionate to do so? Uh, can you extract value through the assignment model? Is it better to look at things from a more traditional kind of conditional fee agreement after the event insurance model? Or indeed looking at things like full third party litigation funding and indeed combinations of those can work together as well. So we'll look at what the different options are. Uh, we'll have a look at the, how those work, how you access them um, and then how to uh, how to know when to do what at the end. Uh, there's a couple of pretty dense slides coming up here, which is all about obligations on practitioners. I'm not going to go to the trouble of reading these out to people. Uh, I'm sure you're all capable of doing that, and the slides will be shared afterwards as well. But just in summary, um, assets in insolvent estates, in liquidations, uh, have to be treated uh, in a way to extract maximum, maximum value for creditors. Um, Typically, what we've seen, unfortunately, is litigation assets not being dealt with in the same way. So, you know, if you had a whole load of tools, equipment, um, property, you would go through a clear process of exploring the market to get full value uh, for that stuff. Um, you have to do the same thing with litigation. And there's a number of uh, rules and indeed case law that supports that. So what it says is that you have to actually go to market and explore what the right options would be to get the most value for creditors. So is it a case that you can just sell a claim to one particular assignment business that you happen to have lunch with or meet at a conference? Uh, no, is the answer to that. Uh, you'd have to go out to at least three or four different assignment options to show that you've explored the market and you can justify your decision. It may be that assignments not even the right model to use for a particular dispute. It may have been much better for everyone involved if uh, the claim had been pursued with funding and insurance, for example. And what I mean by that is, uh, so in if you come out of the world of insol insolvency and look just at general kind of commercial disputes, what you'll find is there's no such thing as assignment. Clients will pursue a claim. They'll, if necessary, take out insurance get funding in order to support their claim and pursue it in that way. But they will retain control of the litigation. The third party that's supporting them with insurance, with funding, will sit on the sidelines, provide liquidity or, or risk management around that particular dispute. But it will be up to the client to actually choose how to pursue the claim, what settlement offers to, to make, what settlement offers to accept or to reject, um, and push the claim as far as they want. That's very different than in the world of insolvency, where for many people kind of funding literally just means selling the claim, assigning it over to somebody else and letting them make all of those decisions around the claim. Um, it's worth knowing that because I think there's there's a, a one or two very big brands within the insolvency space that specialize in funding who particularly push that assignment model. And it's somewhat kind of, uh, skewed the view of the market that that is the way to pursue 
insolvency disputes. There are many other routes to look at out there. But ultimately, what you need to do is explore what the different options are and make sure you're doing the right things. So two aspects to consider, really. Number one, uh, how are you actually going to fund any litigation costs to pursue a claim? And number two, how do you protect yourself and the estate uh, from any adverse cost risks? So what happens if the claim loses uh, and there's an adverse cost ward made against you or the estate? Um, the second one, so the, the risk, if you like, of losing, typically that's covered by insurance. It's a very cost effective way of managing risk. Uh, the first one, which is funding, so how do you actually pay your lawyers? Well, either you can get them on a conditional fee agreement of some description where their fees are deferred until the conclusion of the claim, or you can bring in a third party to actually finance some or all of those fees during the course of the litigation. With regard to adverse costs, um, you've got two issues here, really. Number one is actually the personal liability. So nobody wants to lose their house because a piece of litigation they were running went wrong and are exposed to an adverse cost order. So that's one of the first reasons why you would look at uh, securing some kind of insurance to protect you from that risk. And indeed, if you are assigning a claim, make sure that that protects you from any risk around adverse costs and anything of that nature as well. Uh, understanding what assignments actually achieve, what the documents say, what they are covering for you and what they're not covering for is very, very important. And I would get independent advice on any kind of assignment deed that you enter into. The other issue is generally around security for costs. So I think it's very rare that defendants are actually genuinely concerned around security for costs. Uh, and what I mean by that is they don't have any genuine concern that they're going to successfully defend the claim and then seek to recover costs against you and not be able to do so. But what security for costs is more often used for is a tactical tool, uh, creates hurdles for the claimants to have to get over in order to pursue their claim. So if you're trying to stifle a claim against you, bringing a security for costs action uh, will force the other hand to either lodge cash with court or go off and seek some kind of insurance policy, perhaps buffered with some kind of deed of indemnity or anti-avoidance endorsement as well in order to meet that need for security to then allow the claim to proceed. Um, and we'll look a little bit at how best to deal with those issues as we move on through the slides. So these are really the different tools available to you. Um, I've already highlighted that difference between assigning a claim or having a third party just provide liquidity to pay legal fees, perhaps cover some of the whip or all of the whip of the insolvency practitioner as well. Um, this can also be used in, in bankrupt estates where there's a necessity to go out and recover assets and that might involve um, a significant amount of time and money, perhaps exploring different avenues to see where asset, assets have gone. There may be a need for liquidity there in order to actually perform those tasks. Um, whether to use assignment or to use third party funding will depend to some degree on the merits of the claim, um, whether the other side has assets, if they do, where those assets are, how easy are they to get to, what value is there there, or is it a big question mark and kind of unknown as to the asset position? Another thing to think about is the cost versus the likely return of actually pursuing the claim. So, you know, a claim of £100,000 is absolutely worth pursuing unless it's going to cost £300,000 to pursue and then it might not really be very worth pursuing at all. Um, so you just got to take a view on kind of the commerciality, really, of what's going to be brought back into the estate and where's that money going to go and what's it going to cost to realise it. One of the things we're seeing used more and more over the last probably five or six years is insurance to protect not just the risk of losing and paying the opponent's legal fees, but actually to protect your own position as well. So could you use insurance to cover off uh, the risk of losing and having to write off your whip, having to write off solicitor's whip under a conditional fee agreement, having to write off a barrister's fees under a conditional fee agreement? And the answer is yes, you can use insurance to cover those things as well. So what the insurance won't do is create that cash flow for you to be able to actually spend money during the claim to pay people but if you have got a willingness to pursue things on risk typically conditional fee agreements possibly damages based agreements then having an insurance policy that says look if this claim does go wrong you know you will be paid some or all of your whip from the insurance can be a very cost effective way 
of having that safety net rather than bringing in a third party to fund everything or indeed selling the claim using an assignment model. There are often um, hybrid options that are used. So even if you assign a claim, it may be that the solicitors are still being asked to work on a conditional fee agreement or a partial conditional fee agreement. And what I mean by that is, you know, conditional fee agreement is no win, no fee. A partial conditional fee agreement or partial CFA, sometimes called a hybrid CFA, is a no win, low fee. So the legal team are still paid something to progress the claim, not their full hourly rate, um, if the claim's unsuccessful, that's all they will have been paid. If the claim goes on to be successful, they'll then be paid their full hourly rate and typically some sort of success fee for taking that risk as well. So you can use those kind of CFA, conditional fee agreement arrangements, alongside the after the event insurance that protects the risk of paying the other side's legal fee. And indeed, that same insurance to protect your own fees in order to then access cheaper forms of funding. So you might be able to get, for example, disbursement funding on a claim that's being run on a CFA for a tiny fraction of what you would pay for third party funding or indeed what you would give away under an assignment model. And there are many cases we see where people think perhaps that they're going to have to assign a claim because the other side's not really playing ball and you're going to have to issue a claim and it's expensive to issue a claim, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you could assign that claim, but it may be beneficial to take out an ATE policy perhaps with a disbursement funding to pay the issue fee and see if that brings the other side to the table. And rather than giving away, say, 50% plus of the claim value under an assignment model, you might be giving away a tiny, tiny amount to cover off an ATE policy uh, and disbursement funding. And we'll look at some of the, the numbers around that a little bit further on. I mentioned here creditor funding agreements. I think in most people's experiences, it's very hard to get creditors to fund litigation. Um, I think that will always remain the case, but it is always worth asking the question. And it's worth asking the question whether a, uh, a creditor might be willing to fund a claim if they had the benefit of insurance. So what that would mean is the creditor might be providing some liquidity to pay fees as the case progresses. And if the case wins, they'll get that money back from a cost recovery or out of any successful financial recovery under the claim. If the claim is unsuccessful, they could also get that investment back in the litigation. And the way they would do that is by making a call on the insurance policy that would then pay out those fees they've spent. The reason this can be interesting is if there's, say, one creditor that's perhaps willing to fund a dispute and other creditors aren't, um, it can protect their position a bit, whereby they're not entirely exposed on the litigation and everyone else is getting a free ride. Or it may be a way of attracting a creditor to actually fund something that might not really be economical to bring in a third party to fund separately. So after the event, legal expense insurance. Everyone here will be familiar with insurance. Um, we've all taken out insurance, I hope, for our cars and houses and, and typically holidays and things of that nature. And the way that insurance works, it's before the event. So you take out a policy on, say, an annual basis. Nothing's gone wrong. Um, but what that policy does is protect you from things that might go wrong for the duration of that next 12 months. ATE is entirely different. Um, ATE means that something's already gone wrong. That's why you're litigating. You're about to issue a claim. Typically, that's usually when it's taken out. Um, and what you're worried about is the risk of losing that claim and having to pay the other side's legal costs. So it's not priced in the same way because BTE insurance works on the basis that you insure loads of people, you know, insure every house on the street, knowing that perhaps one or two might be burgled in any 12 month period insure loads of cars, knowing that one or two might have an accident or whatever it might be. So you charge a low premium, but across a very wide spectrum of clients on the basis that the maths just works if you do that. AT is not like that at all. AT is perhaps best thought of as a type of swap, whereby if you issue a claim, you then have the contingent risk of losing that claim and having a costs award made against you and having to pay the other side's legal costs. By taking out an ATE policy, what you're doing is swapping the risk of having to pay your opponent's legal costs if you lose. You're swapping that for an obligation to pay your insurer if and when you win and make a financial recovery. And the reason that's typically attractive is 
if you're running litigation and you lose, well, normally you will have already spent a significant amount of money at that point on your own legal fees. You've lost, and then you're having to write a much larger check for your other side's legal fees as well. That's not a particularly palatable position, and you may just not be in a financial position to be able to do that anyway. Whereas if you take out an ATE policy, the only scenario under which you're going to be paying for the insurance is a situation where you've been successful, made a financial recovery, and then you're paying for that policy out of any proceeds that come from a successful uh, resolution of the, of the dispute. So number one, you're in a better financial position to be able to pay in that scenario than when you've lost. And number two, the insurance itself is typically a fraction of what you, the other side's legal fees are. Uh, and depending when you settle the claim will determine how much you have to pay for the insurance. So to give an example, you might have a claim where you think the legal costs to go all the way to trial are going to be £100,000. So you say to the insurer, we'd like to insure the risk of losing this claim and having to pay the other side's legal fees of £100,000. The insurer takes that risk on board, puts that on their balance sheet. They now have that risk of paying £100,000 if the claim loses. You won't have paid anything at all for the insurance at that point. And if the claim goes on to lose, you still won't pay anything for the insurance. And the insurer will have to pay out up to £100,000 to your opponent for their legal costs. If the claim is successful, you will then pay for the insurance. And in insolvency, what we mean by successful is typically that you've actually made a financial recovery, um, not that you've got some kind of, you know, judgment, pyrrhic victory in court or whatever, but actually made a financial recovery under the claim. At that point in time, you would then have to pay for the ATE policy. And what you would pay for the ATE policy is generally somewhere between 10% of the amount insured. So in this scenario, £100,000, 10% of that, £10,000. So for settling the claim early, you might spend £10,000. If the claim goes all the way to trial, it could cost more like 50, uh, 40, 50,000 pounds, something of that order. Um, so again, significantly less than the 100,000 pounds you would have had to spend on the other side's legal fees. And typically it will rise in three or four tranches as you go along. So if you settled it, say halfway through the claim, it might cost you 20, 30,000 pounds, something like that. This is all agreed at the point where you take out the policy. So what those stages are, um, obviously, these are stages, but the stages only actually kick in at the point of settlement. It's not something you pay for as you go along. It's only paid when you make a financial recovery. You could take out an ATE policy, present that to the other side and say, look, you know, if if we... Uh, if you as a defendant successfully defend this, we've got an ATE policy that protects you and will pay out your costs. The other side might say, yeah, but the insurance carries all these different avoidance clauses, just like any insurance does. You know, if you've, if you've lied on your application and told someone you have, you know, a 12 point mortar lock on, on your front door and it turns out you don't, they're probably not going to pay out on the insurance if you get burgled. Uh, if you tell someone you have a tiled sloped roof and it turns out you have a flat roof, they're not going to pay out when you have a leak. Um, AT insurance would be just the same. So there'll be avoidance clauses saying if you've been dishonest in your application, then it won't pay out. Um, if you've perhaps broken procedural rules as you've gone along, it won't pay out. And the other side could use this to say, well, actually, this ATE policy is not really worth very much to us. If we successfully defend this, it may not pay out at all. So then you can get into an argument, perhaps go to court and argue in front of a judge as to whether your ATE policy is good enough or not with the other side making all those arguments against you, or you could provide something alongside the policy, such as an anti-avoidance endorsement that strips out all of those avoidance clauses, or a deed of indemnity that backs up the ATE policy and creates a direct cut through to the defendant to pay them in the event that there's a costs award are made. These things bolster the ATE. They achieve what the other side's looking to do around security for costs, uh, and allow you to continue with the claim. And they're still a lot more cost effective um, than having to lodge cash with court to meet security. Sometimes you can wrap these things into the deferred and contingent element of a premium. So again, you only pay for it if and when you're successful in the claim. There may be instances where with a deed of indemnity, you, ha you have to actually buy that um, at the point where you take it out. 
then usually about 10% up front. So a hundred thousand pounds policy as a deed would cost about 10,000 uh, pounds to take out at the outset. Normally you'll look to wrap these things into the deferred um, cost of the, the premium. So you only pay for it if you win. In claims where you're uh, bringing injunctions uh, to freeze assets, the other side may ask for a cross undertaking um, for any losses they might incur while those assets are frozen. You might be asked to lodge cash with court as that cross undertaking. Again, an insurance policy could be an effective way of dealing with that kind of challenge rather than having to tie up cash or potentially having to sell the claim to someone who's got money or bring in a third party funder um, with their expensive cash. You could simply take out an insurance policy that provides an indemnity to the side around any cross undertaking and again, allow you to proceed with the claim. Just keep an eye on time, We've got 10 minutes to go. Um, so own cost insurance. I mentioned earlier that this can be a useful way of reducing risk around your own fees. So whether it's the insolvency practitioner's work in progress, uh, the work in progress of solicitors or barristers, or indeed covering disbursements. Sometimes it's taking out just on its own as a way of creating a safety net around the case. So it can be run on a CFA and if the claim loses, um, you can be paid out your, your whip from the policy. Other times it's used in conjunction with funded and it's used as a tool to reduce the costs of any third party funding the claim. It, it's kind of shifting the dynamic basically around third party funding. So years ago, people still do this to be honest, um, although they shouldn't, but years ago you'd go to a third party funder, you'd say, we need funding for our litigation. They'd say, okay, great, we'll fund it but litigation is really risky. If we lose this, we're going to have to write off all of our investment in the claim. Therefore, we need to charge a very high return on our investment in order to justify the risks we're taking around litigation. Fair enough. But then typically what that funder would do is go into the insurance market and hedge their risk because they don't actually want to lose their money if the claim loses. They want to protect their position so that if the claim wins, they make a really big return. And if the claim loses, they at least get their capital back. What own cost insurance does is the same thing, but instead of benefiting the funder, it actually benefits the insolvency practitioners, the creditors, the lawyers running the claim. Uh, it shifts the benefit. So what you would do is you'd take out this policy. So normally you get it from the same people that provide your after the event insurance policy. And you'd say to them, instead of just taking on the risk of this claim losing and paying the other side's legal costs, will you also take on the risk of paying our legal costs as well. It works in the same way as ATE. It just pays out money to you as well as the defendant. You can then use that policy to either run the claim just with the benefit of the policy or to approach a funder and say, look, we've, we've got this policy. It means that if anyone invests in this case, they get their money back if it loses. So can we have a much more reasonable price on your third party funding rather than the usual very expensive returns that you normally try to sell us. So it's a very cost effective way of reducing risk and a very good way of reducing the cost of third party funding. And as I say, you could also potentially approach creditors with this as well and say, look, would you be willing to put something in to this claim knowing that you've got the benefit there of this safety net if it goes wrong, you get your money back. So moving on to assignment, um, I'm not entirely against the assignment model, but I do think it only really works to benefit of creditors and, and insolvency practitioners in certain circumstances. And it's certainly not uh, the perfect solution for every claim. Uh, and what I see in the market is this model being pushed very heavily by businesses that want to take assignment over claims for the simple reason that it's an incredibly profitable way of running a funding business. Uh, buy claims, settle them quickly, make very good returns. Um, but if all that money is disappearing out to the businesses that are buying the claims, it suggests to you that it, somebody's making a lot of money and it's it's not staying within the insolvency sector, if you like, or going to creditors. So how does it work? Well, if you're going to sell a claim, normally it will be for an element of an upfront fee and then some kind of deferred consideration. Uh, that deferred consideration can be significant or it could be more kind of an anti-embarrassment clause. Um, but a typical model 
might be, you know, you have a claim of a few hundred thousand pounds. Somebody offers you a couple of grand to buy the claim, plus 50% of any net proceeds when the claim settles. And by net proceeds, what it would mean is they would take out that initial couple of grand they've paid you. They take out any legal fees that have been spent to run the claim. And then what's left over, split 50-50 between who's actually been running the claim, the assignment business, and going back into the estate. Uh, so it's very simple, very straightforward way of, of running uh, a dispute. Um, you do have to usually still provide a lot of information. It will take up some, some of your time uh, to, to actually pursue the claim. But by and large, it's taken on by the assignment firm. So it all makes sense. Um, why wouldn't I be in favour of it in every scenario? Well, I think on lower value claims, so claims worth maybe up to 150, 200,000 pounds, something like that as a claim value. I think it maybe makes sense because if you were to run a claim like that with a conditional fee agreement, with an ATE policy, and then settle it, it's probably not going to generate huge amounts of money back into the estate, whatever model you use. But as claims get bigger, because you no longer have control over how much the claim settles for if you've sold it, there could be some kind of weird dynamics at play. So let's say I'm uh, taking assignment on a claim and I've paid you a thousand pounds for your uh, one million pound claim and you get 50% of any net proceeds at the end. You might think I would want to run that million pound claim and try and get, you know, at least half a million, maybe 700,000 settlement out of that claim, you know, push it hard and drive the other side to a position where they're going to have to settle for a, a significant amount of money. But if it takes me a year or 18 months to get to that point, and I have to spend one, 200,000 pounds on legal fees to get to that point, my actual return on my investment as a multiple is not that great. So let's say I've spent a hundred thousand pounds, I settle it for five hundred thousand, and we split fifty fifty. So we take off the hundred thousand. So there's four hundred thousand left. Two hundred thousand of that goes back into the estate. Two hundred thousand stays with me, having taken the assignment. So I've spent a hundred thousand, and I've got that back and two hundred thousand. So if you like, I've made a kind of two times return or a or a three times return, depending how you want to work this out. That's great, but what if the other side had made me an offer of, say, £50,000 after just six weeks? Well, I've only spent £1,000 at that point to get the claim, or maybe £2,000, maybe £5,000. I've only spent a tiny amount of money at that stage, and in six weeks, they're offering me £50,000. Now, you might be sat there thinking, well, no one would take that kind of deal. You'd be crazy. You know, clearly this claim's worth a lot more than that. Well, that's true. But if I can settle it for 10 times what I paid for it, or more than that, 20 times what I paid for it, maybe 50 times what I paid for it, if I got it for a grand and they're offering me 50, you know, a 50 times return in six weeks, even if I'm splitting that, 50 50 you go well it's still a 25 times return and bear in mind this is only in six weeks so six weeks extrapolated over a year you know roughly what nine eight nine times so i've made a 25 times return but multiply that by eight or nine you're looking at 400 times return on an annualized basis that's a 400 times return versus the two or three times return i was making when I settled it for half a million pounds. That's crazy difference. And what it means is you've got this weird dynamic when you assign a claim over, that means it the speed at which that business can settle a claim almost supersedes absolutely everything else in terms of what they settle it for. And you don't have any control over what a claim settles for if you've sold it. So it's just something to have in mind that the dynamics are entirely different for businesses that are acquiring claims than what you might think they would be. It's not the same as if you run a claim yourself and you make commercial choices about, OK, what are we spending? What kind of return are we getting here? How far do we think we can push the other side? You know, let's keep going. 
we can get a decent number out of these guys if we just keep pushing the litigation further, you know, potentially get a significant sum out of it. So as I say, on lower value claims, it might not make a great deal of difference anyway. But as claims get larger, I think you have to think very carefully about whether assignment is the right route to go down or not. Just to wrap up, um, so the carrot and the stick. So there's there's obligations, obviously, professional obligations and duties to creditor around choosing the right options around litigation. But also you want to choose the right options anyway, because you want to be able to pursue claims where you can and deliver value for creditors and bring in money to pay off the insolvency fees and, and everything else. So again, you know, that carrot and the stick, if you like. There's loads of different options out there. Funding, insurance, assignment. Uh, I come from a legal costs background, so I'm familiar with all the different forms of, of solicitor retainer as well. You know, fixed fees, hourly rates, conditional fee agreements, partial conditional fee agreements, damages based agreements, and how they interact with things like litigation funding, insurance, whip insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So if you ever want to pick up the phone or drop us an email and just talk something through around what are the options here? That's what we're here to do and to help with. Um, we provide options to loads of different markets. We do it all as a one-stop shop. Um, and what I should finish with is where I started really, which is this is all just about allowing you to make informed choices around um, how you proceed with claims, basically. So if anyone does have any questions, I think I can hand back over to the other Mark and uh, and we can do a quick Q&A if anyone's got anything they want to ask. Thank you very much, Mark, Ruth and Rachel. Um, Quite a lot to think about. Quite a lot of quite a lot of information thrown out to our um, thirty odd delegates. Um, we've um, uh, uh, currently there's no written additional Q and A's in the um, um, in the box, but we did have one question that was posed to um, uh, Claire Ponting at the Law Society in advance, which was this: um, Director's duties. Um, what's the authority? What authority to, to direct to? And do directors still retain um, following the commencement of an insolvency process? This obviously runs back to um, Ruth and Rachel, or I'm happy to pick it up if you wanted me to. Okay. Um, once a company's in administration or liquidation, the director's powers cease. They can't bind the company any longer. However, the duty to cooperate with the office holder still remains. Um, especially when we need information about the company and it's still in their, in their whereabouts. Yeah. I don't know if you don't add anything, Mark. Well, I think there is one su supplemental issue, which I've, which I've faced when advising um, uh, directors um, and the management teams, which is um, their own protection in relation to directors, directors and officers insurance. Um, uh, many smaller businesses don't have the benefit of directors and officers insurance, but it, um, but once uh, a business has got to a certain size, especially if they've got non-exec directors and so forth, then they'll often require insurance to cover them against the risk of, in, of misconduct or negligence claims in those circumstances. And what um, it, it does seem to me that one of the issues that um, many directors may now be facing in some of the processes, in particular moratorium and CBAs, is the availability of that sort of insurance. Um, because in moratoriums and CBAs, the conduct of the, of the business remains with the directors subject to supervision or monitoring. And it's certainly something that um, anybody advising a director in circumstances where there is some financial distress and any concern that there may have been actions in the past that may be a subject of a claim, it's always, always important to review the, the scope of directors and officers' insurance, in my view. Um, and certainly in circumstances where that may be renewed in a process that might involve a period of investigation and time as to whether or not there's a rescue plan available to the company. I've seen circumstances where they've come up for renewal and there's restrictions imposed on those DNA policies. But certainly when you're looking holistically at the position of a director, it's a, it's a key consideration, it seems to me, um, that um, uh, people fall foul of complaint even if there's not been misconduct and the DNO cover can also respond to issues like meeting costs of defending a claim. Whereas Mark, of course, has been talking about the cost of pursuing a claim against directors. Um, generally speaking, um, 
unless there's pre-existing directors and officers insurance, um, directors don't normally have the opportunity of um, easily securing any form of uh, funding or finance to defend claims. And a DNO cover can be really quite useful. Um, uh, we, I think we've got another Q and only question. Um, uh, I'll read out the question. Do funders often require some degree of claims control on a day-to-day -day basis, or do they mainly simply require regular updates or the lawyer's assessment of the merits of the case? That probably feeds back to you, Mark, in terms of um, supporting the, fun the um, funders and insurers around brokerage. Yeah, so the um, they don't have the right to control the litigation. So if you take assignment of a claim, you do, you take complete control. But if you're funding or insuring a claim, it's, it's not yours to control, it's up to the client. Uh, to control it so what you can do is request uh, updates so typically these are usually around significant procedural milestones um, just to know what's happening what time frame is certainly you'd want to be notified if there's any offers made or any offers received even if they're being rejected um, but just to be kept update of kind of major stuff that's happening and and if indeed something large does happen then to be um, made aware if that has any impact at all on um on merits but it's not a case of just you know constantly being badgered by funders and stuff most funders have got better things to do anyway than constantly be chasing uh for yeah. info but just keep keep the communication channels open i would say and if the subcontext of the question was whether or not that adds to the burden certainly in my view it generally doesn't you'd be reporting to the client in any event in those sorts of circumstances and it's sort of recasting that or sharing that information with the, the funder or insurer um, another question, if a company goes into administration and its professional indemnity insurance expires during the administration period, then can the administrator seek third party funding to renew PI, so that's professional indemnity insurance, in order to continue trading? So this obviously contemplating a trading administration, and that, I'm not sure that who that might sit with between us. Well, it's not it's not litigation funding, no, it's so not. it certainly wouldn't be a third party litigation funder that would be doing this. Although some of them do have kind of various different elements of funding that they do, so there may be third party funders for litigation that also do different types of funding as well, and, and could be interested in something like this. I think the real question would be: is if you're seeking money from anyone to do anything, is how are you going to convince them that they're likely to be repaid? Um, and make a return on this. So, so long as you can pitch this as a commercial opportunity to someone that it makes absolute sense for them to invest in it and there's a way for them to make a return on it, um, then I don't see why you couldn't ask someone to to invest in this way. But I don't know, you guys may have a different view on it. I think we'd want to try and find out what was expiring or anything up front before you're appointed and consider the trading. Yeah. That's why, and I can feed into this because um, it, uh, some of it depends on the nature of the profession and the indemnity insurance. Um, um, many years ago, I dealt with a national firm of surveyors where they couldn't renew their professional indemnity insurance because it was too expensive or any part of the market that they were working in. In those circumstances, the absence of insurance was a key factor in leading into into a liquidation and re restructuring. Um, uh, Professions such as surveyors, architects, accountants um, don't have the same regulatory structure around professional indemnity insurance. Solicitors, on the other hand, have minimum terms obliged by the law society that involve a runoff in a sense that the insurance already provides for six years worth of runoff. And in those circumstances, the insurer is already on the hook for the runoff, subject to making a claim for the premium, which is normally three times last annual. Um, in the insolvency process. So it can depend on the profession and the organisation, um, but certainly sort of flipping it, you know, why would you want the insurance in the first place? Um, if, there's a professional if there's a professional negligence claim being made against a business that's insolvent, that's essentially a creditor claim. Um, it sits there anyway, and what generally isn't recognised in the balance sheet or statement of affairs is the value of the insurance policy in professional practices and so forth. But it is there and it protects the balance sheet for the general creditors as a whole. Buying into um, new professional indemnity insurance post-administration is really, really difficult in my experience, I think. 
But certainly, if you're contemplating not professional indemnity insurance, but DNO cover, um, certainly I've seen insolvency practitioners um, um, put their hands into the pocket, into their into the pockets of the estate, as it were, in order to fund a runoff cover, in order to make sure that um, uh, the claims made period under DNO cover can be extended. Um, because if it disappears and it can't be made. Um, um, the DNO cover provides a basis for potential recovery against in individuals that can't actually meet the claim out of their own assets. So um, we've got, uh, is there one in the chat? Um, okay, so I think um, uh, we don't have any other particular questions, but are there any points that Mark, Ruth or Rachel want to pick up on points that the others said? No, that's fine. I think so. yeah. uh, but I think uh, there's just one. There's one final question that's come in there, Mark. It's just okay. under the wire. I think it must be from yep. Colombo. Uh, <laughs> is there ever an argument that funding defensive litigation protects a brand which might itself be an asset for sale? Um, yeah, potentially. I mean, the uh, it's almost the same answer I gave to the professional indemnity insurance one, which is if you want someone to come in and fund something, you simply have to come uh, to present a commercial reason for doing so yeah so you're asking someone to commit funds to litigation litigation is risky even if you've got um, a strong defense there's still risk there um and it's by what mechanism are they going to get the return on that investment so yeah absolutely they could spend that money defending a claim the claim could be successfully defended and then there may be a long tail where they have to wait for that brand that's now been protected is sold and cash is realized to pay back the funding. That's absolutely doable, but you just have to think about what, what's the actual mechanism, how long might it take and therefore what type of returns would be sensible given the risk involved and the time involved in actually being paid back. Um, and it goes back to the, one of the points you were making about um, treating uh, litigation and claims as an asset of a, of a company in an insolvency process. Um, uh, the brand of the business um, is often only recognised when it comes to a sale out of insolvent businesses, because unless it's been an acquired brand, it won't be on the balance sheet. Um, but in in many ways, trying to find a, a basis for protecting and enhancing the brand in the lead up to an insolvency, formal insolvency process, and in that process, can uh, potentially add real value. But it really depends on the nature of the business, the possible brand, and what is already in place to protect it. The context of um, potentially long-running litigation to protect a brand um, could evaporate the advantages that you're seeking to secure, especially since the value of the brand is normally in the business as a going concern, and that makes it more difficult in an insolvency scenario. So, Just to throw one final thing in there, which is, um, I didn't mention this in the, in the talk, but just very quickly, so there may be a scenario where you've got a restructure going on and there isn't really the funds there to do the restructure, but there could be a litigation asset sitting within the business. It's a contingent asset. You know, you'd have to pay for the litigation, run it successfully, uh, conclude it and be paid in order to bring that money into the business. But what you might need is money now to actually do the restructure. Well, as well as actually fi bringing in a third party to finance legal fees, if the litigation is is big enough and exciting enough and, and good enough, then they might also be willing to advance funds against that contingent value of that litigation asset in order to use that money today to do the restructure that you need. So there's all kinds of different things you can do around assets and, and financing. Litigation is no different. Uh, it can be a bit more expensive because litigation is really risky always. Um but yeah, just something to have in mind, really. If that's the only asset there, is how can you utilise it to do the other things that you need to do? Yeah, it's the same as in sort of selling part of a business and part of its assets to fund the, the restructuring process. But I think that now we've reached two o'clock. I think that a number of people have gone off to um, warm up their cup of coffee. Um, um, I would normally stand up in front of you all and thank you and ask you to, everybody to thank the speakers in the normal way with a round of applause. That might be a little bit muted with everybody at, at a distance. So I think um, from my from my perspective, thank you very much to Ruth, Rachel and Mark for a very helpful contribution to what is always in insolvency, an ongoing thought process. 
throwing our ideas around and coming up with solutions because it's certainly my view that we spend most of our time um, looking for solutions to problems rather than delivering problems.